Hey everybody, welcome to session 3.2. We're going to continue our conversation about altruism and economics. Today, specifically, we'll talk about it. Will rather we'll explain the value of a nonprofit to a nonprofit of understanding the supply and demand of altruistic opportunities. And so the reading kind of casts this light. It's the, it's the idea that donors are basically purchasers of a, something called an altruistic opportunity. And when we think about the relationship between donors and nonprofits this way, it actually gives us some interesting insights. The second is to explain the following benefits of altruism. That is why altruism establishes new Nash equilibria, why altruism lowers transaction costs, and why it satisfies Rosenberg's rule. Let's talk about supply and demand. Now, it, most businesses are in the business of selling something. Um, nonprofits that rely on donations don't sell anything. Um, at least it wouldn't appear to be the case. But the truth is they are selling something to donors. They're selling an altruistic opportunity, meaning that a donor is purchasing altruism, so to speak, with his or her donation. Well, if that's true, then, then we ought to be able to draw supply and demand curves. And so um, we've got suppliers of altruistic opportunities, and those would be charities. And we've got demanders of altruistic opportunities, those would be donors. Well, we're going to discuss whether or not the supply curve truly is upward sloping in this sense. So if you're a supplier of altruistic opportunities, this means that each extra opportunity that you would provide is going to be more expensive than the past. And I want you to think if this is true, like for example, if I feed 100 kids with my nonprofit, just feeding the 101st kid costs more. If so, that means we have an upward sloping supply curve. And the on the other side of our chart, we have the demand curve downward sloping. And what that means, if it truly is downward sloping like a normal market, that means that the cheaper altruistic opportunities become, the more people will buy them. So for example, if with my charity that feeds starving children, if we could feed a child for $10 instead of $20, the idea is I'd have more people paying, being willing to pay for that. Um, if this model holds true, there are some interesting observations for us. One is that, well, just like any um, in any supply curve, the cost of the opportunities determines the slope. We're going to get into different factors that affect the slope of the supply curve for nonprofits that supply these altruistic opportunities. Um, it also means that there's always unmet demand, and what that means is there are always people willing to donate. It's just the price isn't right. The, the good that's being accomplished isn't quite cheap enough for them to be willing to donate. Going back to my starving children example, some people won't give $20 a month, but more people will give 10 because at that point it becomes cheap enough for them to be willing to make the donation. And so, but there's always going to be a met demand beyond that $10 a month point because there's some people who would do it for $5 a month and some for a dollar a month and some for a penny a month. And as long as that's true, then there are always willing donors, just not willing suppliers. Um, if this holds true, then there's an important observation, which is that suppliers should focus on their own supply curve rather than on the demand curve. Um, you know, in the nonprofit world, there's an inclination to make donors feel guilty, and the idea is that they should want to donate more. Well, the observation here is no, maybe that's not the problem. Maybe the nonprofits should be focusing on their supply of altruism rather than on what, how much or if donors demand it. Um, because after all, if you can change your supply curve in the following way illustrated here, meaning you move it down and to the right, well, that means you're supplying more altruism or doing more good in the world at a cheaper price. And isn't that what we want to happen? Uh, we'll discuss this in more detail together in class. There are some different factors that affect the slope of the supply curve. It all comes down to a trade-off between cost and um, quantity. Um, so price of the altruistic opportunity is obviously one of the factors, so how cheap is it? Um, but other sort of weight perspectives on this would include the value of the oppor altruistic opportunity. This is sort of the other end of price because everything, everything that has a price comes with a certain value associated with it. So rather than reducing the price, you could increase the value of a product. Uh, in this case, it would be feeding two kids instead of one um, with a monthly donation. Um, whereas if I was changing price, I would just you know, reduce the price of feeding one child. Um, another way to look at it is through accessibility, meaning how easy is it? Every transaction that you enter into involves a transaction cost, which is sort of the personal cost you bear in order to just buy whatever it is you're buying. It's like driving to the grocery store to buy groceries. 
driving there is the transaction costs. And so if you can increase the accessibility of the altruistic opportunity, then you can increase demand for it. Um, and then the last is the elasticity of the altruistic opportunity. Elasticity is kind of a, a fuzzy concept, um, and it might seem especially fuzzy here. One way to think about this is substitutability, meaning how easily can you move from providing one kind of altruistic opportunity into providing another kind. And we'll talk about that idea in a minute. Um, so uh, <clears throat> the reason we bring up this sort of esoteric concept, admittedly, the idea that, that, that nonprofits are selling altruistic opportunities is because it implies, it, it brings out and allows us to illustrate that nonprofits sometimes focus on the wrong things. Um, for example, suppliers of altruistic opportunities, like we said, should primarily be focused on the supply curve. They shouldn't be worrying so much about what donors want. They should be focusing on trying to change what donors want. Rather, they should be focusing more on giving donors what they want. Um, that would mean reducing the price. Uh, it would mean improving the availability. It would mean increasing the value of the altruism that you offer and increasing the elasticity. Um, why a donor gives is only important to improve any of the supply curve factors. Uh, we spend a lot of time wishing that donors wanted something that they don't want, but our wishing doesn't make it so. Uh, we need to be more attentive to what donors want uh, and focus on giving that to them better. Um, I know a lot of people, a lot of you might be thinking that I'm kind of naive in this, in this idea, but uh, I, I don't think so, and we'll talk about this more in class. To illustrate the example, um, some examples of, of the four in changing the supply curve through four ways, you know, price would be a community nonprofit soliciting three times as many donors as the previous year, but reducing the suggested gift by half. A suggested gift has a psychological impact, and sometimes if you set a suggested gift too high, then donors will simply turn you down because it's too, too, too pricey for them. Well, one way you can reduce the price of your altruistic opportunity is reducing the suggested gift. Well, if you do that and solicit the same number of people, you're going to end up with less money. So the idea is to broaden your market reach, lower the price, and you'll make more money through your fundraising. Availability, the Red Cross accepts donations via text message billing. Um, this became a really big deal when the Haiti earthquake struck. Um, that earthquake, uh, the Red Cross raised about a billion dollars with a B um, in response to that disaster, more money than they can actually spend reasonably. But uh, part of the reason it was so effective is because people were able to donate via text message. Um, increasing the value of an opportunity, altruistic opportunity is another way. So an environmental nonprofit that holds an annual awards and auction banquet for its donors is increasing the value to its donors. So they're getting more out of their normal donations and therefore would hopefully be willing to donate more. And the last is elasticity, and I said you can think in this case of elasticity being substitutability, meaning how easily can you move from one thing to another, and so improving the elasticity of your supply here would be like a health-focused nonprofit that develops a system of doing health trainings on demand. And the idea is that this is a new product, it's a new way to make a difference in the world that creates new altruistic opportunities, which in turn are cheaper and better for donors. So questions we'll discuss in class. You know, suppliers in traditional markets can identify a market price, <clears throat> right? If I sell lettuce, I can go see how much everybody else is selling lettuce for. How do suppliers of altruistic opportunities find the market price? Um, the other question we'll talk about, if asking is so effective, which the reading kind of talks about, why do so many people say no, and how can you get more people to say yes? And that's what we're going to talk about more. A third question I don't have up here, but it occurs to me we need to make sure it's clear, is all of this assumes that donors want the right thing, right? I mean, if we're, if I'm telling you that you should be focusing more on giving donors what they want, well, then it assumes that donors want the right things. Uh, is that necessarily true? Do donors always want the right thing? Uh, we're going to dig into that question together in our discussion. Okay. Now, uh, this, this second half of the lecture is to give you some tools. Um, tools because you're going to encounter people that are very cynical about the value of charity. They will argue that the better approach is always to just have self-interested people behaving in rational ways in a free market. Uh, the truth is that that does have a lot of power, but it's certainly not comprehensive. <clears throat> in fact, there are times in which altruism is economically superior to self-interested behavior. And, and I'm going to give you three examples of that. The first relates to the prisoner's dilemma. 
I'm not going to talk about it in this lecture because we're going to play the prisoner's dilemma game together in class as a way for me to illustrate. Um, so we're going to skip that and we'll come back to that. And that's when we'll talk about Nash equilibria. Um, <clears throat> Next is transaction costs. Richard Titmus, um, he wrote a book called The Gift Relationship. He's an economist and he did some really fascinating research on blood donors. And in the United States in the 70s, blood donors are typically compensated, meaning you get paid to donate blood. Whereas in the UK in the same time period, donors were not compensated. They just did it out of the goodness of their hearts or for a cookie or juice or whatever. Well, during that time period in the UK, or sorry, in the United States, when you had compensated blood donors, about 3.5% of the blood supply was infected with hepatitis. And so these are people who knew they had hepatitis but wouldn't donate blood anyway. Um, whereas in the same time period in the UK, less than 1% of the bloodstream was infected with hepatitis. I want you to think about why that might have been the case. Why would compensated blood donors be donating more infected blood than donors doing it out of the goodness of their heart? Uh, we're going to discuss this together, and I want to know what you think the reasons are. The third thing that relates to the benefits of altruism over self-interest um, is this observation called Rosenberg's Rule. So Rosenberg was a professional fundraiser in the Bay Area. had this really cool idea called Rosenberg's Rule, and it basically was the observation that social ills generally grow exponentially faster than the return on capital, return on capital being investment. So you can take your dollars and you can invest them. Um, or you can donate today. And Rosenberg's rule kind of answers the question of what you should do. Because I can invest my money, get a return on my investment, and then donate the, the, the aggregate to charity, right? So the idea is invest today, donate tomorrow. Or I could donate today, which means I don't have the dollars to invest, but, I'm in, but my dollars are making a difference today. Well, Rosenberg's observation is that social ills tend to grow faster than the return on investments do meaning that whatever problem you could solve today is probably going to grow faster than whatever investment you'd put the money into otherwise. For example, you could pay to make it so an extra kid could get into the Boys and Girls Club. Well, the Boys and Girls Club, you guys know I'm a big supporter of it, and the Boys and Girls Club has measurable impact on the lives of young people. A kid who goes to the club is more likely to graduate from high school and go to college is less likely to be in a gang and commit crimes and is less likely to do drugs. Well, <coughs> if that kid doesn't get into the club, then he's more likely to drop out of high school and not go to college. He's more likely to join a gang and he's more likely to do drugs. Well, think about the cost to society that, uh, that a gang member or, a drug, or a, a drug user or a high school dropout impose on society. And think of how fast those costs grow. Um, if you could get a kid in the club today, you can make probably a much bigger difference, economically speaking, than if you invested the money and put it and, and then donated later. Um, to illustrate the point, let's say that your return on capital, meaning the return on your investment, grows at 10% a year. And uh, that's a really, really generous investment that I'm assuming for you. Um, most investments don't return that much, but hey, this is guesswork anyway, so I figure I might as well be generous to investment returns. But let's pretend that the, that the social ills are growing at 20% a year. And I think that's actually conservative, right? Because a kid who's doing drugs is probably, the cost of, of his behavior are probably growing much faster than 20% a year. The same if he goes to jail or joins a gang, the same if he drops out of high school, those costs are probably growing much quicker than 20% a year. Well, here's the difference between these two rates of return. If you take a $1,000 and invest it over a 20 year period, with compounding interest at 10% a year, you would get $6,727 back. So you could take your $1,000 and and later donate $6,727. Well, that's a pretty good deal, right? But if you're going to fix the problem that your $1,000 could have fixed today, you're going to fall short. And the reason is because the problem that grew during the time your dollars were invested grew from $1,000 to $38,338, which is obviously a much more substantial um, cost. And, and so the short, the short observation here is basically, if it's a choice between investing your money to donate later versus donating today, the answer is you should probably donate today. The only time that's not true is if your donation does not make a difference or if alternatively you can invest at a higher rate than the growth of social ills. Um, I'm dubious that that's, that that's ever the case. I think you'd have to be Warren Buffett, to be honest, to 
be able to return an investment um, faster than social loans grow. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, the argument still stands that as a general rule, social loans grow faster. So if it's a choice between donating today or donating or investing and donating the money later, you should donate today um, for this economic, simple economic reason. Okay, that's it. Um, we'll see you all in class.